Hi, everybody. Welcome to another virtual Crosswalk worship experience. We hope this finds you well on this Father's Day weekend. A uh, little shout out to my own dad. Uh, thank you, Dad, for being a good dad to me. And I'm grateful to my own children uh, as a father. Uh, they've been a great blessing in my life. And so I'm very grateful uh, to be your dad. We hope that uh, this weekend is a good one for you. Uh, we still are in this very uncertain time, uh, both with COVID-19 and civil unrest, uh, highlighting racial injustice and inequity. And uh, not exactly sure how it's all gonna play out, but hopefully uh, both will play out in greater health. This service is gonna feature some of the regular things you're used to, some updates from DAR, a couple good tunes uh, from our worship folk, and a special teaching today. I want to introduce you uh, over the next couple of weeks to some voices you may not be familiar with. And today's is just fantastic. Her name is Diana Butler Bass. And man, does she have something to say today. So uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, I think it's going to mess with your brain. And I think that's all very good. So without further ado, let's get to Dar and the, some music and a meditation, of course and then Diana Butler Bass. Welcome to Crosswalk Community Virtual Church Service. Glad you all chose to come along and join us today and hope you've let us know that you would like to be part of our Zoom services during this time. We all get together live on Zoom and we're able to check in with each other and um, actually get to see each other face to face even though it's not person to person. So let us know if you want to be part of that and we'll send you the invite for that. want to just share with you that you may not realize, but Pastor Pete turned a half a century on Thursday, June 18th. So we just want to celebrate that with him. He don't feel too bad. He did get to have a trip with his family. So he at least got to do something for his birthday. But I had a couple people comment about this picture that it looks so sad that he's there by himself. Many of you may have gotten this years ago. He took this picture and was sending it out to people for their birthday. So that's where this photo is from. So happy birthday, Pete. Hope you had a great time celebrating with your family and you got to have your son and daughter home to celebrate with you. So there's always good things to see during quarantine time. So again, happy birthday, happy 50th birthday, a half a century, really? What were you, 29 when you came here to Crosswalk, to Napa? Well, First Baptist in Napa. So grateful we have you here. Now I want to remind you about uh, Virtually Together. We meet on Wednesdays at 12 noon and at 7 p.m. Again, we do it on Zoom, so if you want to be part of this, just send us a text or send us an email and we will get you the information on it so that you can join us on Zoom. And right now they're doing Embracing a Life of Meaning. So again, just let us know if you want to be part of any of these. And the next one I want to remind you is that Monday, June 22nd, Tomorrow night, we're going to be doing dinner group again. We've been trying to do this twice a month uh, during this COVID time. So again, join us. Come alongside. And then ladies, I want to remind you that we're going to do our women's ministry, fuel, fellowship, unity, encouragement, love, and laughter on Sunday, June 28th. We usually do it right after the service. So we're going to do it right after the Zoom virtual service. So again, let me know if you want a link to that. We'll send you a link so you can sign on and be part of it. And then I just want to thank you all for your support for Crosswalk and all that's going on. So we started a summer camp going on on our campus for the Boys and Girls Club. So I just want to share that with you. This is a great opportunity for us to reach our neighbors. A lot of these children are from Napa Valley Language Academy. So we have camp going on in the worship center and in the gym. Approximately 10 kids in each session, so there's not a lot of kids in the room. They get to social distance, but it gives them something to do. It's essentially under daycare because a lot of the parents have nowhere for their school age kids to go during the summer. So it gives the kids something to do. So celebrate that if you're part of Crosswalk and you support what Crosswalk does. Celebrate the fact that our campus is still being able to be used in small groups such as this. So it's a great opportunity again for us to be serving our community in great ways. So thank you for that. Thank you for your support of Crosswalk and for your prayer support for everything. And hopefully sooner than later, we'll be able to be together again. Take care and God bless.
For our meditation today, I want to introduce you or remind you of a prayer pattern uh, that uh, I found helpful in my life and you might as well. Uh, you've heard me talk about the Lord's Prayer being a model prayer, one that we should take a look at the different movements of and meditate along slowly with that, which is great. And I've been doing that a lot uh, for this uh, particular season. It's been very helpful for me. This one is kind of along the same lines, but follows just a little different trajectory and takes us in a little bit different place. It's called the ACTS prayer, A-C-T-S. The A stands for adoration, the C stands for confession, the T stands for thanksgiving, and the S stands for supplication. The supplication part is the part where we ask God for stuff. <laughs> so that one you might be familiar with. And let me just move you through the movements, and then I actually just want to take you through it as a meditation practice, a guided meditation today. The adoration uh, piece is just to simply recognize that um, even though we may struggle to feel with it at all, uh, feel it at all times, the reality is we live in a, an incredible creation uh, that has so much happening all around us, and there are so many things to be grateful for and to show our gratitude for. So it's yeah, in a theological vein, it is a moment of being in awe of the much greater other uh, that there is uh, beyond ourselves. This is also more than just being grateful for a, you know, a bowl full of Cheerios in the morning, but this really is meant to be that kind of like, wow, when I consider the heavens, when I consider creation and all that, I am just blown away. So that's kind of the grounding thing. And that's what happens in the Lord's Prayer, by the way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's that's what we're doing at that point, is we're recognizing that we are a part of in, we are in something much greater than us, that when we realize it, when we wake up to it, it immediately does something to our heart and our perspective. So that's what the adoration movement is all about. The confession part isn't so much for you to, you know, uh, Confess to God that you watched 30 extra minutes of Netflix and you really, you know, didn't want to, that kind of thing. That's that's fine if you need to get that off your chest and stuff. But really, it has more to do with being honest with how we are before God. It's really agreeing with God uh, about what God already knows about us. I mean, we don't keep anything from God uh, that's already known, right? Uh, so this confession part is more for our benefit, it's more about being honest with ourselves and where we are in our life and our journey. Uh, this can be very cathartic for us, by the way, uh, because when we come into a time of confession in that vein, it's really just saying maybe this for you uh, and on this weekend at this time in history, it may be something more like this, like, God, I confess that I am wiped out and worn out by this COVID-19 reality. I am so over it. I am so done with this thing. And I, I can't take another day of news hearing about COVID-19. Maybe that's your confession today. And it's just a lament of saying, this sucks. I'm tired. I'm done with it. And I can't wait for it to be over. Maybe for you, it has to do with um, the racial injustice stuff. And you see this again and you're like, and how many times, God, do we have to go over this? It's just, I'm in such deep pain. And maybe this is you. I'm in such deep pain for the inequity and inequality I see in our country and our community that's just killing me. And I'm just lamenting that. I'm confessing to you that I'm struggling with this and it's messing with me. Or maybe you're on the other side of it and you're tired of it in another way because you're very uncomfortable with it. Well, uh, maybe your uncomfortability with this, even in its rawness and in your privacy with God, you may uh, express some things that are also there related to both of these things, COVID-19 and race issues in America, frustration, anger, um, you fill in the blank. Maybe for you today, it's pain on a different level. I grew up with a good dad. Uh, he provided for me well, uh, treated me with kindness and respect my entire life. Uh, he's human, so I'm not painting him as a perfect example of a human being, but he's really a great guy. And he did right by me in so many ways. And when I complain about any part of his humanity, I realize that by comparison, I got nothing to complain about. So again, Dad, thank you for being a good dad. Some of you had a horrific experience. And for some of you, this weekend, Father's Day is very, very hard because the pain that you endured 
at a very, uh, because of a very unhealthy uh, person who is your father. And so for your confession, that might be it. You just might be saying to God, God, I am just still so wounded by what happened to me. And I'm just so tired of it. And I'm just, this holiday comes up and it just brings it all back. And I don't have any remorse for my, could be your father's past. And you're like, I don't have any remorse for that. Kind of hate the person, angry with it. It still affects me to this day. And that makes me more angry. That's your confession. So this isn't trying to confess to get God to forgive you. I believe the grace is already there. You're already forgiven if you've done something. It's already there. But sometimes we can't heal anything in ourselves until we are honest about what is there. So that's what the confession part is about. I know I'm going a long time on this one, uh, but I think it's maybe one of the most important ones uh, for us to talk about. Because I think in our culture and as human beings, uh, we like to keep a varnished appearance uh, that hey, we've got everything under control, everything's good, when it really isn't. That's when we choose to confess deeply about where we really are, that real health and transformation can happen. So that's why I belabor it. Thanksgiving, the T in the Acts prayer, A-C-T-S, the Thanksgiving is pretty easy. And actually it comes more easily after we've done our confession at times anyway. And that's where you kind of go through your laundry list of things. You've you've kind of talked about what you're struggling. So this is turning the corner. And now you're just kind of expressing to yourself what you're grateful for, your everyday Thanksgivings type of things. They could relate to the adoration stuff, but they're a little bit different. It's just coming to grips again, getting perspective on a, a much finer uh, in a much finer way to your very specific life. And it could be as simple as you have uh, breath in your lungs, and that is plenty to be thankful for, so do that. And then finally, the supplication. It's interesting that we don't start uh, with supplication, because most of us do. Most of us jump right to it, and we're like, okay, God, here's what I need from you today. Uh, what? How can you hook me up? <laughs> and we go through our big grocery list, and sometimes it doesn't really do a lot for us. Um, so what supplication is and why it's at the end is sometimes what we really are praying to God for, what we really want God's help for and crying out, which is a very good thing to express, changes after we've moved through adoration, confession, thanksgiving. It changes what we want. There's, uh, there's a passage I want to share with you. Uh, it's in Psalm 37. These are the first uh, handful of verses. Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn and the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. There's this one verse in there that I think is particularly important as we talk about supplication. It says in verse 4, Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. This isn't talking really about winning the lottery or you know, keys to a new car or something like that or a job or, or something like that. But really it has to do with a frame of mind. Here's the thing. We don't look to God as our genie in a bottle to give us all of our wishes. That's not how it works. But what I have discovered and what I think the heart is on this psalm is that when we commit our way to following God, to be grounded by the Spirit of God, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, our desires actually change. Our wish list changes. And so therefore, as we are in tune with the Spirit of God, when we're in the flow, when we're in the footsteps, when we're in lockstep with the Spirit of God, it is so much more realistic that God will grant us the desires of our heart because we are actually in touch with our heart. Changes. When we go through adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and, suppl and to end on supplication, our supplications change. So let's just spend a few moments of quiet together and work through these four steps in this meditation today. 
So close your eyes, uh, be comfortable, uh, breathe deeply. Check in with yourself and just take a moment to be in awe in the adoration phase of this prayer. You live in an incredible universe and world. The one who is behind it surely must be incredible and awe-inspiring. And now take a few moments and spend it in confession, being honest to God about how you really are. And now take a few moments and express some everyday thanksgivings that you know are part of your life to ground yourself in the reality that there's still a lot to be thankful for. And now spend some time in supplication, asking God uh, to help meet your needs, asking God to shape your heart that it is more aligned with God's, that your heart's desires might even change, and that your heart's desires would be met. Amen.
There are a couple of voices that I want to introduce you to in the next coming weeks, uh, who you may hear more from uh, in the future. This one is Diana Butler Bass. Uh, she has uh, written several books. They're excellent. She is an excellent communicator, a great academic, and I think you are going to love what she's got to say. Uh, so rich and so good. Can't wait to talk to you about it uh, midweek uh, when we unpack uh, what she had to say. So without further ado, Diana Butler Bass. Gratitude might well be the most primal of all human experiences. And it also might be the most ancient of our spiritual practices. Somewhere tens of thousands of years ago, a person came out of a cave, looked up at the night sky, and said, thank you. Thank you. It's so beautiful. It's intuitive. It was that moment, that insight, that helped to make us more fully human, to recognize that the whole of the universe was a gift, and that we as small beings could respond to gifts and say thank you. It is that action and that insight that becomes central to all of the religious traditions that human beings would ever imagine and would ever practice. It's that native, that natural, and that important to who we are. And so I have only one question. Why is it so hard? <laughs> because it really is. Gratitude is not that easy. And all of those religious traditions born in that heartbeat of saying thanks have always known that. They have known that gratitude is more than just that remarkable moment of looking up and saying thank you, but that it was something else as well. It was a calling into a moral way of being, into a way of life that would help us to be able to live in a world of giftedness and abundance, and that it would be a response, that we could live responsibly and responsively to gods or the God who made us and to our neighbors. So it's two things. It's that emotional response and it is a moral choice. Perhaps no single verse in the Christian tradition um, illustrates the difficulty of gratitude quite as well as a verse in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians is actually the oldest book in the Christian New Testament. It is the most ancient piece of theology that we own. And it is a book that talks a lot about thanks. The beginning of it is a long discursive section on thanks and gratitude. And then the book arcs through a whole bunch of questions that were very puzzling to early Christians and ends up with 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you and your experience, um, if you are a Christian. Um, I am a Christian. I grew up with these texts, these stories, these beautiful scriptures. And one of the things that happens with that Bible verse is it, it goes on a lot of posters. It's in pastor's offices. It hangs up in dorm rooms at Christian colleges of my, my female friends. It usually had, like, waterfalls and pink flowers on it. And... Um, I actually sort of came to, to hate that verse uh, because it always seemed like a kind of hallmark card to me. But there was something about it that went well beyond hallmark cards that really bothered me. And what bothered me was the beginning and the end of the verse. The beginning of the verse says, in all things give thanks. 
in all things? In everything that happens in my life, give thanks. Give thanks when I fail at something, when I am in despair, have lost hope, someone I know is sick or a relative has died. Give thanks in those things. And I tell you, all of us have experienced our fair share of disappointment, doubt, and despair. And yet that, that verse just stands there, in all things give thanks, no thank you. I say. And it's not just in those things, those things that might upset my own small personal world, but the things that happen when I turn on the television or open up Twitter and I see pictures of a refugee child who is dead in the waters off of European shores, or I hear about a genocide that's taking place across the planet, a whole group of people being wiped out because of their religion. When I know how much the economic system in which I am complicit keeps other people poor so that I might be rich. When I experience, as we are all experiencing right now, these wild weather patterns which are a sign that our earth is screaming out for us to attend to it. In all things give thanks. Well, count me out. I'm not going to give thanks for any of those things. As a matter of fact, when I hear those things, I get angry and I want to yell back at whoever is that really nice church person standing at the other side of the aisle saying to me, in all things, give thanks. Ugh! No. I have no thanks. I do not feel grateful. As a matter of fact, I think when it comes to all of these things, I am an ingrate. And so, there it was. I took that little verse, and I took that call to gratitude, and I put it in a sort of gratitude box, and I put it on the side of my life of faith, and I went on with things. And so I started studying and writing theology about the big stuff, the really important stuff in Scripture, the stuff about the reign of God, the kingdom of God, God's love and God's justice intertwined with one another, God's dream for the whole of the cosmos, for rest, restoration, reconciliation, and salvation. That was the meat of the gospel. That was the flow of what was really important in theology. And that's what I invested my time in. And then, a couple of years ago, I felt called to start looking at the things that I had put in boxes, the things on the sides that I had not paid much attention to. And that little box marked gratitude. It seemed to call out to me. And so I decided to write a book on gratitude. A lot of my friends in mindfulness communities and meditation communities were telling me that gratitude was good for me. And not only gratitude would it be good for me, but the people who uh, practice gratitude live longer. In my late 50s, I really liked the sound of that. <laughs> and so I opened up the box, and I said, I'm going to write about this. And I'm going to try to write about it from a distinctly biblical, distinctly Christian perspective. And maybe I'll learn a thing or two. And maybe my books will start selling really well, because those kinds of nice devotionals with pink covers always sell really well. <laughs> and as I studied gratitude, something happened that I never anticipated. And that is gratitude began to open up and I realized that I wasn't just looking at some little practice that could be put in a box on the side of my life, but that gratitude was actually one of the most important themes in the whole of Scripture. Through the Hebrew Bible, all the way to the New Testament, the ministry of Jesus, and the very end in the book of Revelation, that gratitude was not a minor chord, it was a major chord. It was one of the, the threads that weaves through everything. And that gratitude actually is part of the reign of God. It is part of God's compassion and justice. It is part of God's dream for us.
And so gratitude became not a little story, but a big story, a narrative by which to look at the whole narrative of Scripture. And in the midst of that, something really, truly surprising uh, began to happen. Is that that second part of the verse, the one that goes, this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ, that began to pop. Because I had always thought about gratitude, not only as a sort of minor chord, something that could be put on the side, but it really troubled me because Jesus was implicated in it. And that somehow to be a good follower of Jesus, you had to give thanks and praise to Jesus, and Jesus was an example of a perfectly thankful life. And that if I was going to follow that Jesus, I had to imitate that Jesus. And when I did this study of gratitude, when I began thinking about gratitude differently, Jesus became different. And Jesus was not just the object of praise and thankfulness. Jesus was not just the example. But instead, Jesus, thank goodness, emerged as an ingrate too. <laughs> and I felt relieved by that. To understand Jesus as an ingrate is a really important call for this particular day and time in our culture. Um, Jesus himself lived in the intersection of two really important cultures. One was his own Jewish heritage and Jewish community, and the second was Roman imperialism in the Mediterranean world. These two cultures were constantly in conflict with one another. And what's fascinating about them is they had two different, very distinctive views of gratitude. The Roman view of gratitude was not just as a moral practice, not just as a sort of nice thing to do, remember to send your Aunt Lydia a thank you card after uh, the holiday for the, the sun, uh, but instead, it was a political, economic, and social practice. If you think about the way the ancient Roman Empire was structured, it was like this, a pyramid. At the top is Caesar and his friends. At the bottom are people who are peasants, slaves, small farmers, freed slaves, and subjects of Roman imperialism. There is a middle group too, mostly soldiers, artisans, merchants, sort of bureaucrats who kept the Roman Empire going. And I've always wondered about these kinds of structures and how they stay in place, because they're inherently unstable. Even though most people are at the bottom, giving the pyramid a big base, most wealth is at the top. And so those people are the richest and most powerful, and it flows down negatively towards the people in the bottom. So how in the world do you keep a social structure like that going, especially a social structure like ancient Rome, which lasted for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and still actually has an impact on us today? Well, you keep it going basically in two ways. One, a really big bad army and lots of violence. And two, you have to have a social structure that invests people in some way in this particular unfair and oppressive pyramid. That social structure in ancient Rome was referred to as the patronage system. And the way it worked was quite simple. The people at the top were considered to be the ones who held all the benefits, and those people were responsible to pass some of the benefits of Roman largesse down to everyone else in the pyramid. When those people at the top, the patrons, passed stuff down, they were responsible to feed people and to make sure people were safe. And so protection and provision and also some level of political power moved from there to there. The people at the bottom then had a responsibility. Their job was to pass stuff back up as an act of appreciation to their benefactors. This was all held together by force of law. Gifts flowed down, and then thanks 
flowed up. And the gifts of thanks that we, the people on the bottom, were supposed to give were taxes, tithes, tributes, worship, honor, utter loyalty, and the complete um, obligation that our whole lives were given over to Caesar and Caesar's empire. This was not something you entered into because you signed a contract or because you wanted to. This was the law. And this system of patronage was a system of gratitude. The stuff that got sent down, those benefits, in Latin that word was gratus, and the stuff that was sent back up, in Latin, same word, gratus. When it comes down, it's translated grace or favor. When it goes up, it's translated gratitude. This was a system of obligatory gratitude that put people in debt to one another always. If someone gave you something, you had to discharge the debt. It was the law. And if you didn't, you could be exiled, sent to prison, or executed. That's where we get the English word gratitude. And that, of course, is where Jesus comes into the story. Jesus lived in a time when that was gratus. That was gratitude. And many of Jesus' encounters are encounters about this system of patronage, including a very simple story that if, you're, if you are a Christian person, you probably know this story from your childhood up. And that is a story where Jesus meets a tax collector named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is like Jesus, a Jew. And Zacchaeus had become a tax collector. People could become tax collectors not by going to, like, Jerusalem Business School of Taxes. Uh, but instead, people became tax collectors because once a year, the Roman authorities, which were very clever, would auction off a few numbers of higher status positions to people who were subjects of Roman imperialism. And you could bid on them, and you could win a higher position in the social structure. And so Zacchaeus, that's how he would have become a tax collector, by bidding on a job and rising up in the social structure. Of course, his job was then to make sure that benefits got down to the poor people, in which case he would skim stuff off as they were making their way down, and that gratitude got back up to Caesar, in which case he would skim stuff off when it was moving the other way. Zacchaeus benefited from Roman gratitude. And so there is Zacchaeus and Jesus. As the story goes, Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is coming to town, and we're told he's short. So he runs to the edge of town, he climbs a tree, gets up in a tree, and he wants to be the first person in Jericho to see Jesus. Jesus sees him, they have this lovely little chat, and then they go out to dinner. It's a wonderful Bible story for uh, elementary school kids. And that's not what it means at all. <laughs> what happens is that Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is coming to town, and he knows something about Jesus. That is, Jesus has been talking about Caesar and taxes in other places, and Zacchaeus is terrified. What is this guy going to say when he gets to Jericho? Is he going to tell people to pay their taxes? Is he not going to tell people to pay their taxes? Is he going to offer one of these crazy parables that he always does and nobody knows what he means by the whole thing? I have got to hear this before anybody else does because this impacts me and my job. And so Zacchaeus does the only thing Zacchaeus knows to do, and that is he runs to the edge of town and he climbs up a tree. Why? Because that's what Zacchaeus does. He's a climber. <laughs> he climbs in front of everybody in order to get a better view, in order to improve his position with the people in authority. And Jesus sees this guy up in the tree, and he knows everything that's going on with Zacchaeus. And he says, hey, you, Zacchaeus, get out of that tree. This is not about a tree. Jesus is saying, Zacchaeus, you come down from that system where you have put yourself as a complicit agent of Roman imperialism. You get out of those branches. Disentangle yourself. Come down. Be on ground with me. And then, of course, Zacchaeus does it. He's so shocked. And Jesus says to him, oh, and by the way, 
I'm coming to your house for dinner tonight. I'm taking you out of that system and structure of gratitude, and I'm putting you into God's vision of gratitude. A table, not a pyramid. A place where gifts are abundant, not scarce. A place where we're all receivers and all givers, that not just a few of us give, and the others of us are in debt forever to the people above us. Zacchaeus hears this invitation, and he takes it. And not only does he hear it, but he says to Jesus, yes, yes, yes. And you know it's political because what he does next, he says, by the way, I'm going to give everything back that I have stolen, and all of the people I have defrauded, I'm going to make it right. He quits his job as a tax collector, and he goes and he has dinner with Jesus, and Jesus says, today, salvation has come to this house. Jesus is an ingrate to the Roman system of gratitude that enslaves us in debt, that holds us in oppression, and that is a system that, based in this beautiful word, has twisted it and corrupted it beyond recognition. And Jesus says, no, I am not grateful. And instead, Jesus resets the ancient story of the Hebrew people. Lord, God, can you set a table in the wilderness? Best question ever asked in the Hebrew Bible. And God, of course, says yes. And that's the question that Jesus answers over and over again. Can we be grateful? Can we be God's people? Can we live a life of jubilee, of thanks, of Sabbath, of true, deep gratitude? Yes, Jesus says. God's dream is here. But you have to be able to discern the difference between these systems and structures of gratitude. Please, Jesus says, come down out of the tree and sit around a table. Or maybe Jesus is asking us finally to come out of the caves where we've been hiding in fear and to finally look up and see the beauty and abundance of the universe and go back to the people we were always intended to be. Thank you. Wasn't that good? Oh my gosh, so good. Uh, I just, I loved her passion. Uh, learned some things that I hadn't thought of before in that Zacchaeus story, so good. So I hope you enjoyed it. Let's finish our time now uh, with the Lord's Prayer. Won't you pray it with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.